Welcome back to The Broken Brain. It's your host, Dwight, joining you once again. This is a fun episode. It's actually an episode that I found in my old archives of episodes that were being edited and stuff to share with you and never quite made it through. I uh, used to record some uh, continuing education trainings at the group practice where, where I used to rent my office. And one of the other therapists there is a wonderful therapist named Andy Welling. And she conducted this training. And uh, with permission, I, I always uh, recorded those trainings. And uh, many of them I would load into the podcast feed here because they were super cool and fascinating. And this is no exception. So I uh, Andy is an expert in movement and dance therapy, and she shares a lot of the principles here about that. And I thought, wow, when I found it, I just had to share it with y'all. So uh, for those who are on the Patreon, you will be able to hear the uh, Thursday This Story History lesson. I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the history of forensic psychology and when and why and how the uh, criminal justice and investigatory community or whatever you want to call it, uh, originally reached out to psychologists to help to understand some things about uh, criminal behavior. So that will be on Thursday for those of you that are subscribers. If you'd like to be a subscriber, go to patreon.com slash broken brain or dwighthurst.com slash support. Now, here is the live at the time recording of this, um, this in-house training by Andy Welling. Clinical right. Mental Health okay, Counselor. Yes. Amazingness. <gasps> We're going to. Are you so excited? <laughs> All right. So I'm Andy. I'm a dance movement therapist and also just a clinical mental health counselor. A few other things, but they don't really matter. So, <laughs> um, and I wanted to talk today about dance movement therapy and trauma and resiliency because I've been really curious about how the creative modality of dance therapy can support the integration of trauma and also foster those skills of resiliency. So keep in mind, I'm like in the process of like integrating all this information. So we'll see if it makes sense. You can give me that at the end, <laughs> not in the in between. So before we st <laughs> yes, start it off good. Before I actually talk about dance movement therapy or anything else, I just wanted to give you a moment to like arrive in the space. So we're coming from different places, maybe from clients, maybe from the crazy weather outside. But I just want you to give a moment like to arrive here, like to settle into your chair. If you're uncomfortable, maybe wiggle around a little bit, stretch. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Maybe look around and see who's... <laughs> perfect you can spread that out just take a look around the room and see who we're sharing this space with and then for just a minute I want you just to pay attention to your breath whoops sorry <laughs> okay <laughs> so I just okay I just want you to pay attention to your breath so you don't have to change it you don't have to do anything different you're just gonna notice how it comes into your body and how it leaves welcome yeah, so you're just noticing. You're going to follow how it comes in maybe through your nose or through your mouth, and then it exits your body. It's kind of cool. It just does it on its own. We just, like, shift our little attention and watch it. <sighs> so now I want you to be a little more conscious about it. So I want you to really take in a deep breath and then exhale. <sighs> We're going to do this two more times, and I want you to imagine that you're taking in whatever you need. So if you need energy, if you need focus, clarity... Soup, food, and nourishment. See if you can inhale the idea of that. <laughs> and then really exhale and let go of anything you don't need. Any stress, any holiday craziness, whatever it is that isn't going to serve our time together for the next 50-ish minutes. Welcome. So we do that one more time, really inhaling anything that you need. Letting it come into your body, your head all the way down to your toes, and then just... Exhale it into the center of the room. If it's important, you can pick it up on the way out. And then just come back, bring your attention up to, to me. <laughs> so I'm curious if you have any idea as to why I would start like that. Filibuster. Yes! It's waste time. i got to get that out of the way. 50 minutes left. <laughs> we 
with one idea. <laughs> it creates a mood. It helps. Yeah. So it creates a mood. It allows us to transition a little more mindfully. The other thing it does when we're talking about trauma is it gives us a way to build that muscle of coming into the present moment. So trauma has the potential to like leave us stuck in the past or catapulted way ahead into the future. If we can practice coming like right here, right now, it's a muscle. We get to build it. The other thing, which is maybe one of my favorite things, is that breath is super cool. It taps into that body wisdom. We don't have to teach ourselves to breathe. We come into this world, our bodies already know how to do it. It's like, dude, got this. One thing we got. It just happens. And that breath supports us. But the other cool thing about it is that it is affected by our physical state. It's affected by our emotional state. So if we're exercising or if we're nervous, we're breathing a little heavier or higher or shallower. If we are calm and relaxed, we have this ability to kind of settle into our breath. Our breath expands. Um, so it's affected by, by our lives as we move through the world. The other cool thing is that we have the ability to like be in charge of it. So let's say we notice that we're anxious or nervous if we're giving a presentation. <laughs> I can notice that my breath is super high and I'm taking in a little bit shallower inhales and just invite myself to <sighs> let it come deep into my belly. So I can use it to support whatever shift in attention or shift in mood that I want. Pretty cool, right? Yes. Yeah. The other cool thing is, as a dance movement therapist, I, I'll, I get a lot of responses when I tell people that. And some of it is like, all right, I can't dance. I have two left feet. There is no way I am ever going to come see you. Yeah, right? It's pretty common. The other thing is, is oh, are you going to teach me how to dance? I'm ready to learn the tango. I, I got these moves. I'm going to, like, let's dance. Which, I mean, that could be a part of the dance therapy session, but the breath kind of, like, levels the playing field. Everyone can do it. It's a literal expansion and contraction. We are all moving. Anyone who can breathe can be in a dance therapy session. So we usually start with like the kick lines, some stuff like that, and some jazz moves. But I mean, that's a, I didn't want to start here like that, you know. <laughs> Had to like. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about dance movement therapy, what it is, and I'm going to talk a little bit about trauma. Some of it will probably be an overview, but it kind of helps me connect the pieces. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about resilience. And then, if we have time, I'm going to ask you to do a little experiential movement thing with me because, as you'll see, dance movement therapy is really hard to talk about because it's a so mad. <laughs> don't worry, you don't have to do the thing. <laughs> no, she's just Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to center someone out in the middle. Yes, definitely. There's booze if you do bad and cheers if you do good. <laughs> Just, no, there's not. <laughs> um, yeah, because dance therapy is hard to talk about. It's a somatic body-based practice. You can easily, like, cognitively make sense of it, but you don't get the feel for it unless you actually kind of get the feel for it. You know what I mean. Maybe you don't yet. So dance movement therapy, the, has, um, the American Dance Therapy Association has this technical definition of dance therapy, and it's like the psychotherapeutic use of movement as a process to further the emotional, social, cognitive, and physical well-being of a person. Super clear, right? Ish, no. Basically what it is is it's a <laughs> form of psychotherapy that uses movement and nonverbal language as an important part of the therapeutic process. That's not to say that we don't appreciate verbal language, because we do. It's also a part of the process. But it's the idea that we take into account what we're saying with our body and with our movement into the session. So it relies on three sort of basic guidelines and premises. The first one is that the mind and body are connected. And what happens in the mind affects the body, and what happens in the body affects the mind. So for just a minute, I want you guys to like hunch down and drop your head and like roll your shoulders, sink back into your chair. Oh. Just take keeps no stay in that position. Y'all move back. <laughs> yep, so stay there for just a minute. I just want you to notice, like shout out some things that you're noticing in this position. Some pain. Mm -hmm. Yes, super hard to breathe. 
disconnected from everybody else because you're not with me. Yeah, disconnected. What else? Yeah, there's like a heaviness and a tiredness. So then I just want you to lengthen your spine, roll your shoulders back, let your head just sort of like rest easily on top of your top of your back. Whew. And then notice how you feel. Much better. It's easier to breathe. A little more easy to connect and relate to the people in the room. So that is an example of how our body affects our mind. But that also goes the other way. As we know, when we see people who are depressed or anxious, I mean, they come in with that flat affect and they're giving us this information that it's really hard to connect. So that's one idea, one sort of foundational principle of dance therapy. The other one is that movement is a language. And it's actually our first language. And it's a really important language. So it starts in utero, like the baby's sort of growing and then it gets its little ears and it can hear. And then it starts to respond to sound. Like they have studies where it responds to the dad sound or the mom's voice, not sound, voice. <laughs> or if they have siblings, the baby starts to interact and respond. The other thing is that like, when the baby starts pushing against the uterine walls, sometimes the parents can develop a rhythm and push back. My mom has lots of stories of me like spinning around and pushing back and then spinning back. She said she knew I was going to be a dancer from the beginning. <laughs> But parents start to develop this interaction, this like rhythmic relationship when the baby is inside of them. That also, because of the mother's carrying them, they get the gait, the, the way that the mom moves, the way that they're, they're like attuning to the mom's rhythm too. Welcome. <laughs> um, let's talk about dance movement therapy. So it starts right from the very beginning. And then the first few years, our interaction with babies and kids is pretty much on a nonverbal level. They express their needs, their wants, their desires, their frustrations, all nonverbally for probably the first year and a half. So they're screaming, they're flailing, they're, they're happy, they're like giggling. And we respond back and we meet them with our own nonverbal language, with our eye contact, with our tone of voice, with the way that we like shape our bodies around them when they're upset or when we want to like tickle them and move them, you know, like when we're engaging with them, we create this nonverbal relationship. Cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. So this is my favorite part. So, well, I have a lot of favorite parts. That would be a lie. I have a lot of favorite parts. One of my favorite parts of this whole idea is that when you have a fussy baby, what is the natural response? Bounce, right? Barring any sort of like trauma in your own self, natural like instinctual response is you have a fussy baby and you start bouncing with them which is literally like you're bringing your rhythm to meet their rhythm. So you're meeting them unconsciously like, hey, I'm here, I got you. This is really hard, it's really distressing. But then what happens after you bounce? Yep, they snuggle in and you, you know the mom sway. <laughs> so you're moving them from that like distressed rhythm. You're shaping up their body, you're containing them. And you bring them into your more fully developed, regulated rhythm. Pretty cool, right? It's like teaching the underpinnings of regulation without even being conscious of it. It's this wisdom that we have, which I think is pretty incredible. Of course, depending on our experiences in our lives, it can get disrupted and interrupted and the wires get crossed, but the body holds that. We don't have to learn to do it. It's like, it just kind of happens. So the last <laughs> premise of dance therapy is that movement is looked at as functional, expressive, communicative, and symbolic. So a functional is pretty easy. If we're uncomfortable, we can move unless we have some sort of traumatic injury. If we need to reach for something on the shelf, we have that ability. We can change positions. We can get what we want. We use movement to serve a purpose. Movement can also be expressive. So we can express like our anger and our frustration without even using words, or we can express our like joy and our happiness, or we can I have a niece who's super dramatic and Everything is this, she, she doesn't just say hi, it's like <laughs> everything is extra dramatic. So she adds emphasis to her words through her movement. And it's communicative. So we communicate to each other what's going on with us by what's happening in our body consciously and con unconsciously. So we can literally like wave, that's pretty conscious. Hey, you're doing good, you're doing bad. Ugh. Or it's sort of unconscious, so like, 
if I came in and I was giving this presentation like, oh, super excited to talk about dance therapy. <laughs> that also sends a different message that you're probably going to not believe me at all or anything I say after that because it's an incongruent message. And I don't know if you guys have ever had this experience, but you like see someone in the distance and you know who they are by just like the way that they're moving. It's like we have our own movement signature and it's pretty cool. We communicate that without even like consciously dreaming this up. It just happens. And the other part about communication is that we have at like our fingertips, literally in this vehicle, a whole bunch of communication that goes on through movement to ourselves. So if my heart's beating really fast, I get to know if it's anxiety, if I'm scared, or I could be really happy and excited. Okay, have this right with me. If I'm breathing shallower, maybe I'm nervous, maybe I'm excited. I don't know. Who knows what it is, but my brain will make sense of it, like taking in all the different information. But it communicates to me how I'm doing. If there's like a meeting that I'm really dreading, that's also information. There's a heaviness of like not wanting to do things that don't feel nourishing. Does that make sense? So dance therapists, they can intervene or they look at movement on all these different levels and there's sort of the idea that it's all a system. So these four domains of like um, wholeness and well-being, the social, cognitive, physical, emotional, if you intervene um, or observe and assess on any one of those things, theoretically they will affect change and the other ones. That's the same idea with the different sort of types of movement. If I intervene on a functional level, that might affect communicative, expressive, and, oh, I forgot the symbolic, the symbolic level. This is the one of the keys of dance therapy. Sorry, back up a little bit. So movement can be used as a representation for an idea or a thing. So for example, at the very beginning of this presentation, so when we were inhaling something that we thought we needed and exhaling something that we thought we didn't need, we can use it to stand in for this metaphor and we can explore that with our clients. Um, and the cool thing about the breath is that it actually literally does that. Like we literally take in oxygen and we literally expel <laughs> gas and waste. So it's kind of cool. But so for example, um, I have a client who always talks about how she just gives and gives and gives and gives and she doesn't ever, she, no one ever gives back to her, she doesn't receive anything. But she sits in my office like this. She's very held, she's very bound, her arms are tight. She has a lot of tension in her fingers. And so one of the things that we played with is like, could she receive anything in this way? Like if someone was going to give her something, could she receive it? And so we played with what is it like to open? And it's vulnerable, it opens up a lot. We can't protect ourselves here, but it's the way to use movement as a metaphor to explore sort of things that are, have the tendency or have the ability to get stuck up in this like conscious processing craziness that can happen. So that's kind of dance therapy in a nutshell. I mean, I can, dance therapy requires a master's degree. It's a dual degree in like an MA in counseling, but then also dance movement therapy theory and observation and assessment and interventions in like specific populations or things. Um, dance movement therapists can work with anyone, any age, any population. Um, the sessions depend on the therapist, they depend on the client, they depend on, <laughs> so they change moment to moment, so it's not like a session could involve me teaching dance or using the form of dance as a way to, to do something, to explore something, but it could also literally just be paying attention to, to those little micro movements that show up in our bodies. Questions? So far? Is it all making sense, kind of? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yes. So trauma. This is good stuff. So there, like, we could spend years and hours and a million days talking about trauma because it's so vast and so there's so much information. There's so many ways to look at it. So I'm going to do kind of a brief overview, and then I'm going to pick out some things that I think will help me make my point <laughs> to what I'm trying to connect. So basically, trauma is anything that overwhelms our ability to cope. So it has the ability to like shock the body, it shocks the system, it can wreak havoc on our lives, it's on our ability to function, to create relationships, to engage with people. We've seen clients who are like armored and stuck in the past and they can't move forward. It's just this constant re-traumatizing. But then we've also seen on the other end, catapulted into the future and anxious and worried and hypervigilant about what's going to happen. So trauma has that ability to do that. 
But here's the kind of cool thing, because it also has the ability, like we see these people who have been in these traumatic situations and they thrive. And they like super thrive. They not just like recover and go on living. They're like, their adversity kind of defines them. And it's like a wake up call. And they get to rewrite their own story and say, man, this thing happened, <laughs> totally sucked. But this is, now I'm going to put my energy into this and this is who I'm going to be. It's like woke up from the things that don't matter and now stripped away what does matter. So it has the potential to do both. And that's what I'm super curious about. Like how do you move from one to the next? And how do you foster those skills that will like build that ability to, to rewrite the story and to look at it in a different way? And of course, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So what's traumatic to one person isn't necessarily going to be traumatic to another person. It's like potentially traumatic events. <laughs> and they depend on a lot of different factors if it's an acute trauma or a chronic trauma or depends on their own internal psychological resources or their support system or the availability of help afterwards or if they were fighting or fleeing, if that action was successful. If it wasn't successful, that's also going to imprint a different story. <sighs> so, dance therapists have always believed that all of our experiences are stored in our bodies. Like, everything that happens in the world is grounded through our bodies and we make sense of it with the somatic, with our the way that we see things, the way that we hear, touch, taste, like our senses. Our experiences come through our bodies, which means that anything good, bad, ugly gets imprinted in our musculature, in our gestures, in our face, our posture. <sighs> which also means that if the story is traumatic, that that gets kind of tagged as a little marker. So we know in trauma that the, the prefrontal cortex goes offline, where like all the energy is devoted to survival. So when the prefrontal cortex goes offline, we have these underlying unconscious memories that are just trapped. And the body is so cool because it marks them. It marks them with little tags that's like, hey, I know you can't process this right now because it's too much and everything is going to be overwhelming, but we're going to mark it with like a little, you know when you hear clients talk about something and they have like a little facial, like, or they like have a little flutter in their fingers or like the body like is pointing us to these, these places that says, hey. So now neuroscience is supporting this belief that these dance therapists came up with in the 1940s <laughs> that like the neuroscience and all this research by like van der Kolk and even Stephen Porges, his, his um, theory is pretty somatic and Peter Levine and Pat Ogden with her sensory motor psychotherapy, all of them are saying we can't do trauma treatment unless we bring the body into the picture. And so Peter Levine's work actually I'm going to talk a little bit about because he separates the memory systems into a really interesting way of understanding what happens and how, how I think is maybe one way we can like start this integration process. <sighs> so that's also a giant, like I'm going to explain it super basic and super fundamental and overly simplified, so don't judge me. But <laughs> there's also only 30 minutes. It could, you could spend like days. So the reason that I wanted to focus on trauma, or not trauma, memory, is because traumatic memories are fundamentally different than just regular memories. So it's sort of like a broad generalization. Non-traumatic memories are flexible. They change. Every time we call them up, they are imprinted with our emotional state, the state of you know, the presence of someone else that we are with, the what's going on in our life or in our environment. So each time they're called up, they're shifted slightly, and then they're re-imprinted with that new information, which is kind of cool. But traumatic memories are fixed and they're rigid because they're connected to that instinctual drive to survive. So hopefully I'll be able to explain that a little bit in a minute. So we kind of have two categories of memories. We have explicit memories and we have implicit memories. So explicit memories are more conscious. We can recall them. They're in our awareness. We have more control over them. Implicit memories lie underneath the surface. We, we don't really have much control over them. So in the explicit category, we have declarative memories, and they're sort of this cold, factual, logical laundry list of operations, things, facts. They don't have much nuance. It's just kind of like, all right, this is the schedule for my day. You can call them up. You can access them. They're not, they're just, they're there. And then we have episodic memories. And episodic memories are a type of declarative memory, but they also serve a really important like bridging function. So episodic memories have a little more texture. They have a little more warmth, a little more 
nuance and vitality. And we can call them up, but they usually come up spontaneously as like these reminiscent memories. So, and they're also called like um, autobiographical memories. So they help us write this coherent narrative of who we are. And each time they get recalled, they also like, they get infused with something different and they really, they give us a sense of what, who we were in the past, where we are in the present and who we can become in the future. So they have all of this information and that could be good or bad. I mean, it doesn't, I'm speaking about it positively, but it could be a negative. You could put a negative spin on it. So, <clears throat> For example, I have um, a memory of my, like, when I'm super, I don't know how old I was, like 12 or something, I have a memory of going to college with my grandmother. She was like 60 years old and she studied anthropology. And it is this moment that's sort of been this like defining memory throughout my life. Like, she was 60, there was no reason for her to go back and study anthropology. She had sort of social and familial barriers against her, but I remember being in the classroom with her and seeing her curiosity for learning and her like, I don't I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm going to do this anyway. And it's been this memory that I call up all the time that like fuels my curiosity and it like defines who I am and who I want to be. Like I want, I want to push the boundaries. I'm curious. I want to learn a lot of things all the time. So that has become this like memory that is defined over time. And each time I remember it, it gets like more exciting. And I'm like, yes, I'm meeting it. Oh, no. And then I can like add in new information and be like, okay, got to take a new class. So it has this information that like connects everything. It gives us a sense of who we are. It also serves this really important bridge between those declarative like factual logical memories and those implicit like unconscious memories. So this is going to be really important in a minute. Let's see what time it is. <sighs> okay. <I> can do it. <laughs> you are doing it. Yes. So does it make sense so far? Okay, so in implicit memories, we have two types. Well, I mean, there's probably a lot of types, but the basic, like, broad categories are these emotional memories. And they show up as this, like, collage or barrage of sensations and behaviors and, like, movement patterns. So they show up as just these physical sensations, which, interesting side note, emotions are actually physical sensations in our body. So our body feels something, travels up to our little limbic system, scans around, and it's like, all right, I feel happy. I think I feel scared. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. So, <laughs> so we have these emotional memories. You're doing great. Yes, thanks. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to have I know. I'm like That's waiting for the... What's Canadian? That's right. Right. Oh. <laughs> it's like a backhanded. <laughs> So uh, the cool thing about emotional memories is that they go through and they flag important experiences in our life, important, important events. So they're going to see okay, we're in this experience and they're going to tag it with an emotional marker and it's going to give us important information that's going to be related to our survival, either our biological survival or our social survival, which as we know it is as important as biological survival. Maybe not as important, but it's pretty important. So what I mean by that is, I'm trying to think of an example. So, so let's say you're a child, you're super distressed, you're hurt, something is going on, and you cry. And let's say you have really great parents, they come and they pick you up, they take care of you, your needs get met. So that experience is going to be tagged, like, okay, if I cry, my needs are going to get met, or whatever, whatever the... If you reach out, if I cry, whatever the movement that you're doing or the experience that you're engaging in, that's tagged as a as a memory that says this is gonna, this is this is a, an example for the future. If I'm in this situation, and it gets stored, and we start to create like schemas and maps of how we're gonna engage and um, interact with the world. Now the problem comes in is if we are distressed and we're upset and we're hurt, and we have a parent who neglects us, or we have a parent who hurts us, or we have a caregiver who, I don't know, I whatever. They don't meet that need. And so then we learn, we tag that with, okay, this response isn't going to help. So, so, what do, so what do I now have to do in order to get my needs met? And the body starts adapting and creating these, these responses. So that's what these emotional memories do is they go in and they tag these situations with a marker. And it gives us information that says, when I'm here, this is a, this is a possible reaction that's going to help me out. 
Now they're linked to what's called procedural memories and procedural memories are like these deepest implicit layers of our memory and they're super cool. But they, they come up as sensations and impulses and behaviors and movement patterns that give us information of how we're gonna how we're going to respond to various activities in our life. So there's three sort of categories. There's learned movement patterns. So we learn how to cook, we learn how to dance, we learn how to sing, we learn how to be a therapist. And at the beginning, we really have to think through it. We have to go through the steps. It takes a lot of energy. But eventually, we don't have to think. We can get on a bike and we can just pedal. It's not like we're like, OK, lift up my leg, go through this, go through this. It becomes unconscious. And those types of procedural memories, they, they form the foundation, because that also could be with, you know, like walking and, and, and other sort of movement patterns. But as we learn more and acquire more skills, those, they get enhanced. We can be more skilled at these movement patterns, these things that we're doing. Now, the other type of procedural memories, they are hardwired emergency responses. And they, they come when we're under threat, when we're stressed. And they are movement patterns that are like contracting or bracing or fighting or fleeing or freezing. Like they're these hardwired things that come in when we are, we're in danger. And they pattern us so like to give us the most optimal like ability to survive. But they're all stored underneath conscious awareness just as muscle memory and movement patterns. And the third type is kind of interesting. Um, it's this approach avoidance system. And it's this also the somatic information that says, hey, if I go towards something, this is going to be nourishing, or pull away if it's not. It's kind of cool because it's this innate, this innate system. So we don't, we don't have to think through. We just, just kind of know if, if nothing, is like, nothing is wrong. Just kind of know if a person or a situation is going to fill you up with energy or if it's going to be toxic or painful. That's when we do that. Scoot away. Yes? yes? So traumatic memories, they're stored in that procedural memory gap. And they are rigid and they're inflexible because they are designed to help us survive. So anything that's going to be what we perceive as a threat, and that's tagged by those emotional memories, in, in addition with other information, but it's like those are so hardwired and they're so innate that they are going to override any sort of explicit, implicit, any other memory form. So that's why these traumatic memories get stuck. They're rigid. It's like a fixed action pattern. So what we want to do is <laughs> get to know those. So we want to bring those into, the, into like consciousness. But we want to link them back to that episodic memory. So theoretically, if we can work with these like rigid traumatic body patterns and we can mark them with another emotion. So let's say we have someone, we're working with them in the presence of a compassionate therapist. We can imprint that, that body memory with a new emotion. So then, like, then it gets back to the episodic memory that says, okay, I'm going to tell the story in a new way. I get to rewrite this. It takes a long time because it's hardwired. You have this like dirt road of experiences and ideas and things that happen, but but it's possible. Just <laughs> anyway, once we bring our attention, and I think, I'll go into this later, but I think there's a piece of that that fosters resilience in noticing and accepting it and saying, hey, this is here. And then once you give it that sort of attention, it can start shifting and moving and transforming. Like it takes it out of that just really survival-based place. So this brings me to resiliency super quick. So I just want to talk about resiliency really quick because I have been super curious about how dance movement therapy as this creative somatic process can actually like perhaps, I don't know if it works yet, I'm experimenting, start integrating trauma while at the same time infusing these like skills of resiliency that are really important. I think I have the sense that probably a lot of people do that, but I've just been spinning around in my brain lately. So resiliency is it's a process, and it's a process of adapting to really hard situations. It's like the ability to bounce back. It doesn't mean the hard things aren't going to happen to you, but it means you can kind of cope and recover. Not kind of. It means you can cope and recover and then come out on top. So they've done a lot of like longitudinal studies, and they've done just sort of other studies, but what they found is there's a combination of psychological factors, and then there's also just a combination of like luck. You, you got dealt this hand, so... Good job for you. Um, 
And, and some of the psychological factors are having a really strong internal locus of control. So no matter what happens, you believe that you have the ability to, to, to be OK and to make it through this. Um, you also have the ability to rewrite the story. So you can say, you can look at this and say, man, because trauma like totally destroys the story that you had before, has the potential to do that. So you look at that and you're like, all right, you know what? I can rewrite this into my amazing story or whatever. You have the ability to rewrite the story. So you look at it from a different perspective, which sometimes is known as like reframing, looking at negative things in a positive light, which I think is good, but I think sometimes there's a step missing <laughs> in that. Um, and they have the ability to not reality. So it's not like they're denying and pushing it off and saying this wasn't really terrible. They can say, hey, this really sucks. This is super terrible. And I hate that this is what's happening right now. But I know I can get through it. So they're not pushing it away or making it worse or ignoring it. They say, OK, this is what happened. Now what? Now the luck factor. If people have an experience of a caregiver or a mentor or someone who offered them unconditional love, they are more likely to be resilient. So resilience isn't just a fixed point. You're not either resilient or not resilient. And people who were resilient, if the stressors start to outweigh that resiliency, they can crash and not be as resilient. Or people who've never been resilient, they can also learn how to become resilient. So that's a pretty cool thing, too. So in the last 10 minutes, I want to explore and be curious about this little like movement thing. So I'm going to lead you through a little movement experiential, which is it's going to be fun. Or it's not, I don't know. But <laughs> we'll see. It's going to be deeply healing, life changing. It'll be something. It yes, it will be whatever. Um, but before we start, there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's the way that you move is the way that you move. It's going to be pretty sort of minimal. I know. Um, I have my score sheet outside, so I won't score you in the moment. But yeah, so I want you to just settle. You're going to shift around, wiggle. We're going to come back into our bodies since I've been like spewing a lot of cognitive <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and I want you just to take a minute. This is sort of like an EMDR exercise where I want you to imagine a mildly upsetting event in your life. So not traumatic, not something that's going to overwhelm your symptom your system, something that's just upsetting, whether it's an argument with a sibling or a coworker or your spouse or a client or some situation that when you imagine it, you can feel that activation in your body. Does that make sense? So if you want to, you can close your eyes. If you don't want to close your eyes, if you can imagine like a center point in the middle of the room, you're just going to have soft focus. So you have this memory, and I just want you to watch it like you're watching a video. You can pause it, you can rewind it, but you're just trying to get the details of this event. What's happening for you? If there's another person, what are you noticing about them? Notice how you're breathing, your shoulders, your jaw, your belly. And then as you're noticing how this, this memory is expressing itself sort of internally, I want you to give yourself permission to express it externally, but with your hands. So we're only going to express, you know, whatever part of this is the most poignant with just your hands. So you can do it all together, repeat it a few times. And then I just want you to repeat it a few times. So we're going to let this movement just repeat. We're going to notice. How is it showing up? What are the qualities? Is it tight? Is it soft? Is it pressing? And then I want to see if you can just make it a little faster. So there's no judgment. You're just going to do it three times just fast. And then come back to that original gesture. Just kind of notice what's happening. Notice anything that has shifted or not shifted inside your own self. And then I want you to play with it and I want you to make it super slow. Like this expression of this memory is stuck in jello and you are going to move through it. It can be Christmas jello or green jello or it can have marshmallows in it. Whatever your jello looks like, you're going to move through it super slow. 
Make sure you're breathing. And then I want you just to come back to that original movement and be really curious. After exploring different possibilities, has it shifted? Has it changed? Does it want to shift? If it does, let it. If it doesn't, you don't need to force it. There's just the possibility. And then I want you to shake that off and kind of let that go. You can make sounds if you want. Or if you don't want, that's okay. I'll make sounds by myself. <laughs> um, so hold on to that experience. Kind of notice anything that you notice. But really, just for another moment, I want you to imagine just the opposite. I want you to imagine a really lovely, comfortable, wonderful memory. We're going to do the same, same process, but with this juicy memory. So it can be with a person, with a really good moment you had with a client, <sighs> whatever it is, some memory that fills you with warmth and calmness and you are safe. <laughs> it's hard to call up this memory because sometimes it can be. Imagine what something would be like. You know, if you don't have a memory that's easily accessible, what is something that would feel really good for you? Can tap into the power of our imagination. And again, you're just going to notice. <laughs> notice your thoughts. Notice your body, your heartbeat, your breath, your shoulders, your jaw. And I want you to do the same thing. So I want you to let this memory express itself through movement in your hands, just in your hands. Just repeat it a few times and notice. Just notice what you notice. <laughs> I want you to see if you can make it even bigger. So whatever that means to you. And then you're going to shrink it down to you super small. And then I want you to come back to that original movement that you very first were trying on. And see if it has shifted, if it wants to shift. If it doesn't, that's OK. There's no right or wrong. Just give it space to change if it wants to, or space to be exactly as it is. You're going to take a really deep breath. You can let that movement sort of slow, and then exhale. Bring your attention back into this space. So for just a minute, as a whole group, I want to move three times from that first motion that you created to the second one. So we're just going to do one into the other all together with our eyes open three times. Yes? Someone gets to be in the center. No, just kidding. <laughs> all right, are you ready? So we're going to start with the distressing one. <laughs> and then let it move into the, the calm, loving one. We're going to do that three times. So then when you're done with that, you're going to go into that distressing, sort of like, oh. And then, whew, calm. last time, really make it like, oh. Yes. And then, whew. nice. Wiggle and shake that out. Maybe. Um, yes. So really quick. These, I think these points maybe came out, but if not, I just want to summarize them because I think maybe this process has the ability to do a few different things. Like number one, it brings the trauma from the inside out and we get to experience explicitly, so we're turning the brain back on. And I think we do it in the presence of, it, like taps into that social engagement system, whether it's our own sort of uncom uncompassionate, <laughs> compassionate, unconditional love that we say, hey, this movement is here. I see you. I'm not going to push it away. I'm not going to do anything. I think that's first. We have to bring it in and say that it's okay to be here. And then we infuse creativity into it. We play with it. We change it. We have it outside of us, so we look at it from a different perspective. So it fosters that ability too. And I think all of those things lead to helping create a different story. Yes? No? I don't know. Woo! <laughs> Yay! Any questions? Time.
know. It's nice to meet you too. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.